So the, the Great Pyramid had a very sophisticated mechanism of operation where it created a self-protective coating compound okay. that protected the inside of the chamber. Okay. So I propose that the King's Chamber is actually a sulfur furnace reaction chamber where sulfur dioxide was introduced into the chamber and it was reacted with air. So you do have these air shafts mm -hmm. leading into the King's Chamber. And my hypothesis is that they were literally just air intakes. You don't have, like, he said, you know, the maser and the, the, the hydron emission and all this stuff. It's literally just an air intake to bring air into your furnace chamber. Okay. Because you need air to facilitate the reaction of sulfur dioxide and oxygen into sulfur trioxide. Okay, but if it was one of those air intakes in the king's chamber has like a crazy, crazy bends to it where it goes around yes. that that new void they found that's like the size of a jumbo jet Correct. or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, was the scan pyramids or something, the yep. scan pyramid project, they they scanned it and they figured out there's this big undiscovered void Correct. that's next to the grand gallery. And one of those shafts that goes out of the king chamber does all these crazy like right turn and angles to avoid that thing. Correct. To wrap around it. Yes. So like that's an, that's another crazy question to this thing. If if they built this like amazing machine out of these in, massive blocks, yeah. and they had a plan to do this, why would they? Why wouldn't they build it in a better way where it could just be like a straight shaft out and and then be like instead of trying to like avoid some other part of it that they built? It seems like they just like if like either they just figured it out as they went. And they were like, oh, shit, we got to work our way around this big void. Yeah. Or all those angles that they took with that shaft were by design. Yeah. So I think that there was meticulous engineering in these things. Mm -hmm. And everything that they did was very intentional. And I love the fact that you brought up this big void because it's, it's located above the quote unquote grand gallery chamber. Right. And I have a perfect explanation for what this thing was doing and how it was implemented into this chemical reaction process. Because the reaction of dissolving sulfur trioxide into water is an extremely exothermic reaction, generates a ton of heat. Mm -hmm. So if you have an ancillary chamber above your contact process chamber where that reaction was occurring, you can absorb that heat energy and remove it from the structure. This directly ties into the function of the black basalt floor that is adjacent to the Great Pyramid because that hot water from inside of the void above the Grand Gallery was flowing out of that chamber and running through the channels that are underneath this black basalt floor on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid, heating up that material. Uh, can you show, do you have like an image of this I can see so I can better understand it? So let's say here, um, okay. probably not in this particular, okay. but we can just run through okay. this part real quick. Okay. So again, air was coming through those air intakes. In the king's chamber. In the king's chamber. Okay. That, that mixture of gases was being pulled through the antechamber. And the antechamber of the Great Pyramid is made from red granite along with this furnace chamber. And I've already mentioned that you're saying the antechamber was the furnace chamber, or no, or that was the king's so chamber. So the antechamber is actually your catalyst chamber. It is a sound catalyst chamber, something called sonochemistry, acoustic chemistry, where you can use sound waves mm -hmm. to catalyze chemical reactions. This goes back to the inverse piezoelectric property of quartz where electric fields were flowing into the red granite and activating the inverse piezoelectric property of quartz, create, creating vibrations that elicit ultrasound. And ultrasound is basically sono, sono chemistry. They use ultrasound vibrations to create chemical reactions. Okay. And that's what was occurring inside of the antechamber. Is it, and I have a whole slide deck on the... Sono chemical reactions inside of the, the Great Pyramid. So and which which one of these chambers is what? Yep. Okay, in, so in, let's go back here. Okay, the burner so, is the king's chamber. Correct. Yeah, the converter where you see SO2 going into a catalyst chamber. Yes. That's your antechamber. Okay. Then you have your absorption tower, which is your grand gallery, and your dilution and extraction tank is your queen's chamber. 
Okay. So uh, j- keep this configuration in mind where you have king's chamber, anti-chamber, contact process chamber, Brain and gallery. extraction chamber. Okay. So again, another depiction here showing the process. Okay. And this is, again, just kind of an explanation of how sulfuric acid is utilized as for the manufacture of fertilizers, metal, metallurgical processes, right. et cetera, et cetera. And we'll get to the, the configuration of the Great Pyramid here in just a second. But if you take the sulfuric acid that was being produced in the Great Pyramid, and then you introduce it into the Central Pyramid, which is the middle pyramid on the Giza Plateau, you can fill that chamber with a concentrated solution of sodium chloride. Introduce your, your sulfuric acid solution into that chamber, and it will create hydrogen chloride gas, which can then be dissolved into water to create hydrochloric acid. Mm-hmm. So there's a connection between my work and Christopher Dunn's work in that I do believe hydrochloric acid was being manufactured on the Giza Plateau. And I don't think he goes into an explanation of where the hydrochloric acid comes from. No. But in the central pyramid, it has the exact same configuration. And they found a sodium chloride coating inside the chambers of the central pyramid. So you need sodium chloride salt to create the chemical reaction between sulfuric acid Mm -hmm. and the sodium chloride to create hydrochloric acid. And they found that salt coating inside of the chamber the primary chamber of the central pyramid. Okay. So can you explain to me one more time? Yes. The, the, <laughs> the great pyramid. Yeah. All of the chambers. Where does this process start? All right. So the process actually starts in the subterranean chamber. Okay. And there's a guy named John Cadman uh-huh. that proposed that the subterranean chamber is a pump chamber. He believes that it was used to pump water out of the structure through that southern shaft outside of the subterranean chamber. So there's a a shaft going down into the subterranean chamber from the north. There's a pit leading out of the bottom. And then there's a shaft going out of the southern end. That goes nowhere, right? That goes nowhere, correct. So John Cadman's theory is that it was a pump to pump water out of that southern shaft. The big big issue with that is it's a completely dead-end shaft. Right. And I was just in there for a special permission inside the Great Pyramid. And we got great documentation where all of us climbed through that Southern shaft Mm -hmm. because I wanted to get it on camera to prove that that was a dead end shaft and nothing could be pumped out in that direction. But I do believe that the configuration of the subterranean chamber is indicative of a pump chamber that pumped water from the subterranean chamber up through the well shaft into the Grand Gallery and um, Queen's Chamber. Okay. So they and where did the water come from? Just like the yeah. the ground. So there's there's subterranean water below the Great Pyramid for sure. Mm-hmm. But all of these pyramids had external reservoirs. They had enclosures surrounding the structures that were filled with water to facilitate these chemical reactions. And even in the ancient descriptions, they talk about the pyramids being floating islands. Okay. So they were surrounded by these reservoir enclosures that were utilized, for example, in the operation of the Red Pyramid. The water from the reservoir was introduced into that inlet shaft and utilized to facilitate the chemical reactions inside the Red Pyramid. Okay. Same thing happened in the Great Pyramid where that water was introduced into the subterranean chamber. The northern pump shaft was filled, right? So you have an external reservoir. Do you have, do we, do you have a diagram? Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, right there. That's perfect. Yeah. So, so this. So number five, the subterranean <laughs> chamber is. Bless you. Yep. <laughs> so the external reservoir surrounding the Great Pyramid basically came up to the, where you see the number one, where that inlet shaft is. Mm-hmm. So the water would have poured down into the subterranean chamber, and if you put a pump block into that northern chamber and compressed it down into the shaft, it will push water up through that well shaft. The vertical one. Correct. And I believe that there's even important information encoded in the conventional archaeological nomenclature, right? It's a well shaft. They call it a well shaft. Okay. So what's the function of a well? To deliver water. So that is the exact function of this well shaft is by activating your subterranean pump chamber, you're pumping water up through the well shaft, delivering it into your Queen's chamber and Grand Gallery chamber. Now, number six, was that, yeah, so was that, that. A, that, that um, 
Yep. Was that originally there? Or was that was that dug through? Yeah. So when you see number two here, that is the excavated cavity that was carved and into the Great Pyramid to gain access into the structure in the modern day. Right. In number six is a vertical, like a, a diagonally inclined shaft that has these granite plug blocks. And even the conventional archaeology states, and that's why I have this little red circle, because these red granite blocks were originally at the top of that shaft. And it was an emergency shut-off mechanism that if the pressure inside of the chamber ever got too high, it would release those plug blocks, push them down into the bottom of that shaft to relieve the pressure inside of the system. So there was something catastrophic that happened to these Egyptian pyramids that caused them to go offline. And they all have emergency shut-off mechanisms built in. Same thing as you would have with a modern chemical reactor, where right. if something goes catastrophically wrong, mm -hmm. you have to have an immediate shut-off valve to prevent the, the situation from just blowing the whole structure to pieces. Right. So that was the, my, my idea on the function of these red granite plug blocks okay. and of shaft number six. Okay. All right, so we're going to skip ahead a little bit, but let's imagine that the Great Pyramid gets struck by lightning. There's an accumulation of positive charges from these telluric currents in the earth. So you have these flowing electrical currents that move through the crust of the earth. And this is where these dielectric materials are incredibly important. So Chris Dunn talks about seismic waves. I'm talking about naturally occurring electric currents in these telluric currents that are flowing below these structures. Mm -hmm. And the limestone is a dielectric material that is going to store these electric charges and cause a phenomenon called dielectric polarization of the material. And this is how batteries work today, where you get a slight negative charge at the bottom, slight positive charge at the top. You have a separation of your charges that allow the storage of electricity. So this is why modern batteries, you have a conductor, you have a dielectric material and another conductor. Mm -hmm. And it's the magic of these dielectric materials that allow us to store energy in batteries. This is exactly what was happening inside of all of these structures, including the ancient structures of England and Ireland, where they were storing electric currents from these telluric earth currents on the surface of the earth. And they either have obelisks, pillars, or standing stones or at the Great Pyramid being the tallest structure. Well, technically, the Central Pyramid is the tallest one. But I truly believe that the Great Pyramid was designed without a capstone. It was meant to be flat at the top, which increases the surface area at the top of the pyramid to allow the accumulation of positive charges. Hmm. And I have another... There's another episode that I've done on the channel where they've introduced electromagnetic charges into a simulation of the Great Pyramid. And it was designed to accumulate charges directly where the capstone is missing. So in this experiment, they introduced an electromagnetic field into a, a simulated design of the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. And there's literally a flat part at the top of the structure where all of these charges accumulate where there is no capstone. It's in the exact same location. And I believe that was the intentional design of the Great Pyramid was to leave it without a capstone to allow the accumulation of positive charges on the surface of the structure to attract these lightning strikes. Okay. And they needed the lightning strikes because it would charge the stones and blocks inside the pyramid? Correct. Yeah. So these, the limestone, again, is a dielectric material, and it is going to store the electric fields from these lightning strikes. And this is also how these ancient stone circles like Avebury, mm -hmm. they were used to attract lightning strikes by harnessing these electric fields on the surface of the earth. You have a standing stone or a pillar, which provides the lightning strike, a location to hit. And then they distribute the electric fields throughout the rest of the temple complex. So Avebury is known as the serpent temple complex. And I believe that the serpent is an ancient symbol for, well, there's also the plume serpent, the deity Kukul Khan, which descends onto the, the, the pyramid of Teotihuacan. This is another symbol encoded in that structure that indicates lightning. We, we'll get to that here in just a second. I've got some slides on Teotihuacan and the symbolism of the feathered serpent. Right. Lightning, right? The plumed serpent. That is an ancient symbol for lightning strikes. 